Welcome back to Anomalum Chronicles, where the mysteries of the universe unravel. Are you ready to dive into stories you have never heard before? At the end, if you enjoyed the video, then I urge you to subscribe so you won't miss anything. If you have any suggestions or critiques, please leave a comment below. But for now, let's get started with today's story. I stared at my grandfather from the couch. He's got the screen door open, standing on the porch, and he's leaning against the railing overlooking the front yard. He grunts as he stands up straight and takes a deep breath in through his nose. It's going to rain, he says in a low, gruff voice. I hate the rain. I look down at my phone and pull up the weather app. The weather channel says it's going to be sunny the rest of the week, Pops. I don't care what the goddamn weather channel says, Brian. My leg hurts and I can smell it. Rain is coming, mark my words. For the past 15 years, me and my brother have spent the summer with our grandfather, Anderson. We call him Pops, and though it was a rare occurrence in this part of the world, I've never once known him to be wrong about the rain. Come inside, dear, and shut that door. You'll let out all the cool air, my grandmother called from the kitchen. I watched my grandfather stretch on the front porch before limping his way back inside. Pops has had that limp since he was a boy, some kind of accident when he was young, and any time I ask, he just says, I'll tell you about it when you need to know. But even with the limp, Pops isn't a person to take lightly. Six four with a barrel chest and a beard that made him look like he belonged in the mountains. He walked into the kitchen and gave my grandmother a kiss on the head. Seeing them together always made me laugh because my grandmother was only five feet tall and 125 pounds soaking wet. Sorry about the door, dear, my grandfather said. What would I do without you here to remind me? She gave Pops a sarcastic side eye and went back to cooking. Brian, Pops called out, go get your brother out of bed. You guys are going to be here for the next three months, and I refuse to let him sleep it all away. This is my time with my grandsons. On it, Pops, I called back. I made my way out of the living room and down the hall to my brother's room. I knocked on the door. No answer. I knocked again. Nothing. I turned the handle and made my way inside. My brother June was fourteen, a year younger than me. He was splayed out on his bed in his boxers, and he looked miserable. Brian, it's a thousand degrees in this house. If they don't turn up the air conditioning, I don't think I'm going to make it for three months. I looked at him sideways. You are such a drama queen, June Bug. Now get up. Grandma's making sausage and eggs. He smiled slightly and groaned his way out of bed. He grabbed a pair of shorts and put his hair up in a ponytail. We made our way into the kitchen and sat down for breakfast. Pops was reading the newspaper and dropped it just a bit to peer over the top at the two of us. We really need to do something about that hair, June Bug. Your mama might have given you a girl's name, but that don't mean you gotta lean into it. Listen here, old man, June shot back. You can call me girly all you want till I take that cast iron skillet and give you a limp in the other leg. All right now, boys, my grandmother cut in. We aren't having any of that at this table, so make nice or ill be the one making use of this skillet. Pops and June smiled at each other as Grandma dumped large helpings of sausage and egg onto our plates. We spent the rest of the day watching TV and spending time with our grandparents, listening to Pops tell every story about his youth except for the one I wanted to hear. The left leg. What happened? That next morning, just like Pops had said, it started raining. Three weeks. Three weeks it's been raining. It hasn't let up in the slightest, and it seems that, every passing day, Pops gets more and more apprehensive. Me and June were sitting on the couch watching the weather advisory when Pops came in and turned off the television. I looked at him confused. What's up, Pops? He sat down in the old lazy boy and sat forward with a worried look on his face. You boys know why you can smell the rain? Me and June looked at each other and back to Pops. We both shrugged. I can Google it for you if you want, Pops. He shook his head and stared at us, more serious than I've ever seen him before. Google ain't gonna tell you what I'm about to tell you. Pops ran a catcher's mitt-sized hand down the front of his face, and he began. What you're smelling isn't actually the rain. 
you're smelling a mix of ozone and petrichor. Petrichor is a chemical that comes from a combination of chemical compounds. Plants break down microorganisms in the soil, and when that soil is disturbed by rain, it releases the fragrances into the air. I looked at June and back at Pops. So, plants absorb nutrients, secrete the nutrients. When it mixes with water, it smells good. In simple terms, yes. Okay, why do we need to know this? I looked at him a bit confused, and his look stayed serious. Now, boys, I'm no expert, okay. I don't know how this stuff works, so a lot of this is just speculation. But what if I told you that explanation is only half right? What if I told you that the reason the soil smells the way it does is because of the creatures that hibernate deep in the ground? I looked at Pops quizzically. You mean like moles and stuff? No, not like moles and stuff. What if I told you that there are creatures buried deep in the soil whose bodies secret this thin layer of mucus to keep their bodies safe while they sleep? That since their bodies are always secreting this mucus, it dehydrates them and keeps them dormant. What if I told you that once the rain penetrates deep enough into the soil, their bodies are rehydrated and they make their way out to feed? A smile started to creep over my face and I started laughing. If you told me that, then I'd tell you that you needed help, Pops. Jesus, man, I thought this was going to be serious. I looked back at my grandmother to see if she was laughing with me, and when my eyes met hers, she looked grave, and she looked down at the floor. Wait, I said. Pops, are you serious? He had his elbows on his knees with his fist in his hand. He was looking down at the ground and then slowly raised his head. I'm afraid I'm very serious. I told you that I'd tell you boys how I got this limp when you needed to know. I believe you need to, now. Pop stared off for a few seconds before he began. It was about forty-five years ago. I lived in a small city called Gullersville. Don't Google it, cause it doesn't exist anymore, and I'm the only one left alive that remembers that it ever did. Anderson, you get away from that window, right this instant. My mom yelled at me from the kitchen. It's been raining every single day for almost a month, and the only thing I want to do is go outside and see my friends. The ground isn't even solid anymore. It's turned into mud that you can sink knee-deep into if you aren't careful. I backed away from the window and walked into the kitchen. I'm sorry, Mama, I said. It's fine, sweetie, but with this crazy storm and all this wind... I'm just waiting for any of these windows to blow out and I don't want to see you in front of one when it happens. Just as she finished talking, the front door whipped open and my dad made his way inside. The barn is locked up, but the animals are still losing their minds. I need this rain to ease up or we're going to end up losing everything. Don't worry, dear, my mom said. Even if we lose it all, we can start over. As long as I have you two, everything will be okay. My dad blew air out of his nose, gave a half smile, and kissed Mom on the head. Well, Anderson, for your sake, I hope it lets up before next week. It's not every day a boy turns 13 and I don't assume you want to be stuck inside when it happens. I looked up at my dad and smiled. He looked over at my mom and shrugged his shoulders. It's a good thing the town set up these irrigation ditches. If we hadn't, Gullersville would be a lake by now with this damn storm. My mom rubbed the back of her neck and looked over at me. Why don't you get ready for bed, Anderson? I'll be up shortly to tuck you in. Yes, ma'am, I replied and made my way down the hall to my room. I dug through my drawers for my pajamas and jumped in bed as soon as I heard my mom's footsteps coming down the hallway. She walked in my room, tucked the covers under both sides of me, and gave me a kiss on the forehead. I love you, dear. Now get some rest and let's hope the rain is gone by tomorrow morning. I love you too, mama. She made her way out and turned off the light. I settled in and closed my eyes when I heard a loud ticking coming from outside. It sounded like someone trying to call their dog inside by clicking their tongue off the roof of their mouth. I laid there confused for a moment as I kept hearing the sound. Finally I got up and made my way over to the window. The lightning flashed and I saw something. My window over looks the pastures. 
It's just all land as far as you can see until our closest neighbor's property line starts. But when the lightning flashed, I swear I saw a head sticking out of the muck. I stared hard out into the darkness at the spot where I saw the head and strained as hard as I could to see. And then another flash came. This time I saw the body. When the lightning flashed a second time, I knew what I had seen. A head and a torso, hands in the muck, wiggling to set itself free. From what I saw, the upper part of the body was about two feet long, grayish-green skin stretched tight over a bony frame, no lips, and jagged teeth protruding from the gums. I fell backwards away from the window and screamed. My mom and dad came in a few seconds later. I was on the ground, on my butt pointing at the window. My dad made his way over and pulled the curtain aside. What's wrong, Anderson? I don't see anything. I shot up to the window and stared out hard to where the thing was, making its way out of the mud. I waited for lightning, and it finally struck. Nothing. The thing was gone. Dad, I swear it to you. Something is out there. I saw it clawing its way out of the mud. You have to believe me, Dad. Please. Okay, son. Okay. Calm down. You probably just had a nightmare, and with all the rain, you probably dreamed of it coming out of the mud. I was about to cry at this point. I looked over at my mom for some semblance of help in this situation. She looked at me and back to my dad. Maybe you could just walk the porch, John. Put his mind at ease. Mama was giving him a sad look and was ruffling the bottom of her old blue and white apron. Dad looked over at my mom and took a deep breath. Okay, dear. I'm on it. He smiled half-heartedly and walked out of my room and into the room that he and Mama shared. I heard the old glass door to the gun cabinet open. He walked out of their room and passed mine again. He held up the shotgun so I could see it and raised his eyebrows. If there is something out there, Anderson, it's about to have a really bad night. I heard my father's footsteps echo down the hallway and out the front door. I heard him pace the long front porch and then turn to come down the side my room was on. My mother was standing in front of the window with the curtain back watching my father as he stared out into the night, clothes whipping at his body from the strength of the wind. I watched my dad as he leaned forward off the porch and stared into the night. Click, 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 five, quick clicks back to back. I strained my eyes to try and see into the dark, and that's when I saw my father raise the shotgun, stock to his shoulder, eyes forward and the barrel lightly following something that was just beyond my field of vision. Crack. A blast shot through the night air, and that's when I heard it. The sound of claws hitting the roof and side of the house. My dad backed up against the siding, and I couldn't see anything outside the glow of the porch light. He still had the shotgun raised, looking for anything out of place in the night. Then I saw it. It jumped down from what seemed to be the roof of the porch or the siding above. It landed with a plop into the mud, and light illuminated the creature. It was on all fours, with a thin frame. It looked like someone took gray, slimy skin and pulled it taut over a skeleton. Its head was almost as large as an adult human's, but with slits for a nose, and skin underneath that immediately led into teeth. Its eyes were milky white and they just lulled and rolled inside their sockets. It was about four to five feet long with two inch razor sharp claws at the end of each finger. All four legs had what looked to be hands with five fingers. A cold chill immediately ran down my spine. I watched its eyes roll around in its head for a few seconds. I watched my dad pull back the forend and eject the spent shell and pulled it forward immediately to chamber the next. As soon as he did, the creature's eyes stopped rolling and snapped in my dad's direction. Those clicks came right after. The creature took one step onto the porch and dropped into a position to lunge. It screamed and sounded as if someone was trying to yell by sucking air into their lungs instead of forcing it out. Crack. Another shot rang out as Dad peppered the thing's chest and sent it flying backwards into the night. Then I heard a skittering of claws above and around me. Plop, plop, plop as these things hit the mud outside. From the glow of the porch light I counted, at least, 
Seven. No telling how many were outside my field of view. My dad began to slowly back away around the corner of the house and towards the front door. Mama made her way out of my room and into the front of the house to help Dad back inside. I watched Dad until he got back around to the front and then looked back over at the things out in the muck. To my surprise, one had made its way onto the porch and when I saw it, I let out a short gasp and stepped back. Immediately the thing was up and its face was in the window. It hit it hard enough to shatter the glass so maybe it never saw the window to begin with. I stared ahead into this thing's face watched as the milky eyes rolled in its head, glass protruding from a few wounds. It was darting its head up, down, left, and right. Then I heard those clicks again, and the eyes stopped rolling and snapped directly to me. Its eyes got really wide and I swear it smiled. Next thing I know, the creature is leaning back on its haunches and comes face first, diving through my, now non-existent, bedroom window. I screamed as it came flying into my room, body sprawled out, and its legs kicking and raking the floor as it attempted to regain its balance and get its bearings. The first thing I noticed was the intense smell of incoming rain. I know this smell. It's fun. It's safe. God, I love the rain. I heard the shotgun cock for a third time, and it knocked me out of my trance. I shook my head and looked down at the thing, now completely focused on my bedroom door where my dad stood. Dad held up three fingers and mouthed, On three! Dive right! I shook my head so he knew I understood him. He mouthed one, two, three! I dove to the right and folded into a ball. The floor creaked in protest under my weight, and the things he'd snapped from my dad shout to me, and for the third time that night I heard that crack ring out. Inside the confined spaces of my room that shotgun blast sounded like dynamite. My ears were ringing as I felt my dad reach around my waist and scoop me up with one arm. As my hearing started to return to normal, I caught the tail end of my dad yelling at my mama. He attic, there's no windows up there. Grab as much food and water as you can haul. I'll hold them off. Mama ran for the kitchen and dad stood in the middle of the living room head on a swivel. He's watching the hallway, the front door, and the living room windows. Then I smelled it again. Rain. A relaxing, earthy musk. Dad must not smell it. Because if he did, he wouldn't be so uptight. I absolutely love the rain. Anderson, what the are you doing, boy? Snap out of it and go help your mother. I shook my head again. What is that? I'm on it, Dad. I found the last bit of courage I had remaining and made my way into the kitchen. When I got into the kitchen, I saw the canned food scattered across the ground, and my mom standing still, staring out of the open kitchen window with a smile on her face. Three of those creatures stared in from outside, each clicking over and over again. One reached through the window and grabbed my mom by the throat, the other by the shoulder. I sprinted forward and half-tackled my mom, wrapping both my arms around her waist. The jolt of my slamming into her must have knocked her out of the fog she was in because she immediately started screaming as loud as she could. The moment she started screaming, those things started frantically pulling at her body, trying to get her out of the window. My body was almost entirely out the window when I felt a set of large hands clamp around my shoulder and chest. Let go, boy. Just let go. The creatures pulled at my mother, and my dad pulled at me. The third creature came down on Dad's arm with its claws, but he never let me go. My arms gave out as the creatures pulled my mom from my arms. Dad pulled me back in through the window, with the third creature still firmly attached to the meat of his arm. The creature kicked up like a cat and dug the claws of its feet hard and deep into my left thigh. I let out a yell as Dad pulled up his left arm so the creature was face to face with him. He jerked his right arm pulled the 1911 from his hip holster and planted a bullet firmly between the thing's eyes. The creature immediately went limp, but Dad just kept shooting, bullet after bullet into this thing's body. He holsters the 1911 with a huff and came over to me. He picked me up in one arm and threw his other hand over my eyes. Don't look, Anderson, he said as he made his way over to the open kitchen window. I shook his hand off and stared hard out into the night. Another flash of lighting showed my mother being dragged into the muck. 
Both the creatures must have been well under the ground by now, just dragging her deeper because the mud was already up and past her stomach. She was clawing at the mud trying to escape with the sounds of the wind and thunder drowning out her screams. The sky went dark again. Another flash of lightning about eight seconds later, and my mom was gone. Pop sat back in his chair and I just stared at him. I had no idea what to say. Me and my father made it to the attic. It was another three days before the rain stopped, and those things disappeared back into the muck. When we came down, the ones my father had killed were all shriveled up like mummies. I think those things need a specific amount of moisture in the air to remain above ground. When the mud finally dried up a few days later, we took the truck into town. Not much was left but the buildings and a bunch of human-sized holes dug straight down into the earth. Not a single soul was left. I didn't know what to say. Pops wasn't the joking type, but if this was true, the same creatures that maimed my grandfather had killed my Greek grandmother. This is the first time in fifteen years I've ever heard Pops say a word about his mom, so I believe him. Pops put both hands on his knees and pushed his way out of the lazy boy. He looked over at Grandma and gave her a small nod. I watched him walk across the living room and split the blinds with his thumb and forefinger. Pops took a deep breath as Grandma made her way back into the living room. She carried a long black duffel bag over her shoulder and sat it on the couch next to us. She unzipped the bag and reached inside. She walks over to Pops and points her forefinger to her head. Pops smiles, leans down, and kisses her right on the top. Here you are, dear. She hands him over a well-kept black 1911 and an old pump shotgun. You sure you want these? We've got quite the collection. Pops smiled and patted her softly on the cheek. This is personal, sweetheart. Save the good stuff for you and the boys. Me and June looked at each other. The boys? A sudden gust of fear and excitement flooded my body as my grandmother handed me and June freshly oiled Mossberg pump shotguns and a pair of Smith & Wesson .45s. Grandma sat down in Pop's lazy boy with a shotgun spread across her lap. She took an old cloth out of her apron and began wiping it down. She looked over at me and June, smiled, and winked at us. Pops took a deep breath in through his nose and let it out through his mouth. He cracked his knuckles and turned to look at the three of us. Keep your head on a swivel. Look out for your family. Do not shoot if you might hit one of us. Me and June nodded. Yes, sir. Now lock and load. I know they're coming. I can smell them. God, I hate the rain. Pops peered out through the blinds and took a deep breath. Now listen, boys. No matter what you see, no matter what you hear, shoot first and ask questions later, unless it's one of us four. I nodded at Pops, loaded a round into the forty-five, and racked a shell into the Mossberg. I'll be honest, I haven't felt more alive than I do at this point right now. I stared over at Pops, peering through the blinds as lightning struck, followed by a loud boom. Pops looked back at me and June and gave us a single nod. He looked over at Grandma and gave her the exact same thing. I heard Grandma give a deep sigh, and she looked at the two of us. Boys, we've taken you hunting your entire lives. Let's see what you're made of. June stood up and pulled the tie out of his hair, letting his curls fall to his shoulders. Yes, ma'am. Pops looked over at the two of us and nodded towards the window. Me and June stood up and made our way over. We stood on either side of him as he split the blinds in two. We watched as lightning struck and turned the darkness into daylight. For a split second I saw three figures halfway out of the mud outside and my eyes grew to the size of grapefruits. I stared at Pops and then to June. What on God's green earth is that? I call them muck crawlers. Not sure what the scientific name for MI is. Pops winked at me and I felt a little more at ease. I backed away from the window and looked over at June. I'll stick with Pops. You protect Grandma. Pops let air out through his nose like he was trying to blow out a candle and laughed harder than I'd ever heard him before. Boys, boys, I met your grandmother in the army. She was a ranger. Her unit referred to her as the Red Dahlia. She's the only other person I've ever met that has dealt with these things and survived. I assure you she doesn't need protection. 
Your grandmother beat me unconscious back in the 70s when we mistook each other for the opposing side. Me and June stared at each other for a moment and then over at Grandma. She was still in the lazy boy, staring down at the Mossberg and wiping it off with a towel. You ready, Red? Pops was looking at Grandma and she looked up at him. Oh, this brings back memories. Grandma stood up and racked a shell into the Mossberg. Don't worry, boys. Grandma will keep you safe. Pops looked out the window as another lightning strike hit. Lights on. They use echolocation, so don't worry about them seeing you. Stay as small as possible and keep the noise to a minimum unless you're putting them down. Aim for the head or center mass. They are very vulnerable to gunfire, but what they lack in thick skin they make up for in numbers and brute strength. I nodded and slung the Mossberg over my shoulder. I pulled the forty-five and fired up the flashlight under the barrel. Why do we need flashlights when we still have the lights on in the hu- Lightning cracked, and I saw it hit the ground only a couple hundred yards away from the house as the power went out. Oh, I see. Got you. Storm's knockout power. I'll shut up now. As soon as the power went out, I heard three clicks and flashlights spark one after another. I drew up the forty-five, remembering the clicks from Pop's story, and waved it back and forth. Calm down, boy, Pop said. You'll know them when you hear them. A few seconds later, I heard ticks above us and the walls surrounding. It didn't sound like echolocation, more like claws digging into the roof and siding. Another crack of lightning hit the ground outside in the boom of thunder. I looked around the house, and then the clicking began. Pops described it as the sound of someone trying to call in a dog by clicking their tongue off the roof of their mouth. This sounded deeper, like it came from their throats. I can't fully explain it, but it sent a chill down my spine. Get away from the windows and anything that can crash in on you. Pops walked away from the window and towards us when his leg locked up and sent his other knee into the floor. It made an audible thump as Pops let out a cry of pain. Grandma ran over to him and put her hand on his back. Anderson, are you okay? It's the Dagham rain. My leg is stiffer than it's ever been before. Christ Almighty, it feels like I'm pumping fire through my veins. I heard a tick on the window, and I pulled the forty-five high to aim the flashlight. Pop's explanation didn't do these things any justice. The skin was still covered in muck. It looked wet and putrid. The teeth were brown and black, no lips, and sharper than anything I've ever seen. Picturif Baraka from Mortel Kombat and Smeagol had an angry, blind, bastard child. The eyes rolled in opposite directions. Red and blue veins led to the milky white corneas, and the teeth opened and closed like a wild animal, anticipating its next meal. I gasped, because frankly, I couldn't hold it in, and I watched the eyes snap straight to me. Its mouth opened wide, and those clicks sounded out deep and angry. I watched as the crawler leaned its head back and then thrust it forward, quickly. The window shattered as the rest of its body came flying in through the window. Grandma stood up, spun on a dime, and her point forty-five was held straight forward. The thing's trajectory sent its maw directly into the barrel as Grandma emptied two quick shots into the back of its mouth. Its body hit the floor, and immediately the intense smell of rain and blood mixed in my nostrils. I felt my head start to swim a little, but the smell of blood kept me from hitting the state of trance that Pops had talked about. I looked up to assess what had happened when Grandma smacked fire out of me and my eyes went big. What the hell, Grandma? I'm fine. You could warn me before you hit me next time. Sorry, dear. You can't be too careful, you know. She said it so lightly that I swear she just wanted a reason to smack me, but I shook it off and made my way over to Pops. How you feeling, old man? Can you walk? Brian, I will shoot your foot off, so help me God. Just help me up and get me to the couch. Now, Pops is a large man, much larger than me, so I asked June for help and we hoisted the old man up to make our way to the couch. Now Pops is the ranch type. I've never seen him go a day without his wranglers packed into a pair of cowboy boots. And today wasn't any different. 
As we got him up, he started complaining about the leg itching worse and worse. We sat him down as he laid into the sides of his jeans with his fingernails. Lord Almighty, Red, cut this blasted thing off. I pulled out my pocket knife. June was on my other side and I got him to pull the pant leg of his jeans taut. As soon as it was, I stabbed into the material. I was about a quarter of the way through cutting off his pants leg when I was hit hard by the smell of rain. And Grandma spoke up. He doesn't mean the pant leg, boys. I stopped cutting. I don't even remember what the big deal was. I love the rain, and I always have. It helps me get to sleep when I'm anxious, and it's great to listen to on the porch with a nice cup of tea. Grandma put her arms on me and June's shoulders and sat us down on the couch next to each other. I looked at June, and he looked at me. I love you, bro, June said. I love you too, June. We don't say it enough. We both laughed as we listened to the sound of tearing coming from next to us. Grandma stood up and stood between the two of us. Now, boys, I love you both very much. I watched Grandma smack June as she brought the butt of the forty-five down on top of my head. The pain immediately racked my skull, and I stood up rubbing the spot she had just pistol-whipped. Don't whine, Brian. You were affected once. It's harder to bring you out a second time until you get used to it. I was never under any spell, you crazy old woman. What was that? I love you so much, Grandma, and thank you for your help. I looked over at June and he was staring at Pop's leg. I looked down, and even as I sit here writing this, I wish I hadn't. Pop's leg was gray, blue, and wet. The leg ended at what looked to be a hand with five fingers and long, sharp nails for each. Pops was leaned back into the couch with his hand over his face while each nail tapped rhythmically, one after another like the villain in a bad horror movie. If they get claws or teeth into you, parts of you will begin the change. Don't let them touch you. Your grandfather has dealt with this since he was twelve years old. He told you we got into an altercation when we were younger. If I hadn't slashed open his pant leg in the middle of the fight, I would have killed him. But that smell calms you. I sat there and waited for him to regain consciousness happily. I assume it's how he got into the army with that thing in the first place. It makes him very persuasive. I went to speak when Pops shot up off the couch. We had been talking, and I hadn't noticed another one of those things make its way through the open window. I spun around only to notice that Pops' flashlight had a hard shake to it, like he was freezing. This particular crawler was a bit different. It still had patches of long brown hair, only one milky eye, and half of its mouth had lost the lips and grown the elongated teeth. It walked on two legs, extremely hunched, unlike the other crawlers who seemed to be quadrupeds. Other than that, the only real defining feature was the blue and white apron that still hung, tattered, off of its body. I watched the beam dash quickly, back and forth over the crawler's frame. I looked up at Pops and saw the 1911 shaking violently in his hand. Pops, Pops, are you okay? Talk to me. I raised my forty-five and backed up slowly behind him gun trained on the thing. m m, -m. Pops stammered, and I watched his face drop. He opened and closed his mouth while he rocked his head back and forth. Pops heaved once and only once. He steadied himself, and immediately the beam stopped shaking. The crawler opened its mouth and I heard the clicks come from the throat. As soon as it quit, I heard the screaming Pops had described. Like it's trying to scream, but sucked in air instead of pushing it out, the crawler wailed out. Anderson, come to mama! Pops screamed, as inhuman as I've ever heard him before. It sounded like a mix of human and angry mountain lion. Pops took ten steps forward, pulling the trigger every single step, with no hint of a limp. He was complete, he was determined, and he was dangerous. I noticed way too late that I was watching my great grandmother be put to rest. Finally, after so long, she will receive a true peaceful sleep. Thanks to her son. Ten shots at center mass. I watched her body drop in a heap in the living room floor.
Anderson, my grandma started. They all die, every single one of them. Make it hurt. Anderson, I... Every single one of them read. Every single one, dear. While Pops and Grandma were talking, I made my way over to the broken window with June. He threw the Mossberg off his shoulder and racked a shell. He said, make it hurt. I smiled and followed in June's footsteps, pulling the shotgun off my back. I looked over at him, a little concerned. We've been making a lot of noise and we haven't been swarmed. For things that rely on sound, that doesn't seem odd to you. June looked around, and I could see that what I said had hit home. He looked me in the eye. I haven't heard the ticking of the claws either. Look out the window together on three. I nodded at June, and he whispered the countdown. One, two, three. We stuck our heads halfway out the window and peered into the night, waiting for a crack of lightning. About three seconds later, it came. An empty field with nothing to see for miles. That's when I heard a soft tick from above. I moved slowly to turn my head and look above us. As I did another crack of lightning, I was able to remember at least twelve coming down the side of the house, while June swung around onto his back and went to pull the shotgun to fire. As he pulled it up, the barrel caught on the bottom of the window and made a loud thunk. Then, like a wave, the crawlers released their grip on the siding and extended their claws towards our faces. At the last minute, Pops and Grandma yanked us inside by our shirts, and we heard set after set of claws hit the porch surrounding us. In no time, Pops was up and ready to fight back. We listened for the clicks to tell us they were incoming. But they never came. What we did here, on the other hand, was what sounding like the growl of an alligator. Google it if you've never heard it. It's terrifying. A low, guttural growl that I felt resonate in my body. I looked over as Pop's busted leg made a forward leap into the floor and attempted to drag him outside. Luckily, Pops is a powerful man and stayed in one spot, but we listened as the claws ran off the porch into the opposite direction. We slowly made our way up to the window to peer outside. Another crack of lighting, about eighty yards closer than the last one that struck the ground, illuminated the night sky once again. Another quadruped-like crawler, except this time if stood about six and a half feet tall on all fours. Its body was about six feet long with a five-foot tail. Its head was about three feet in diameter, thin, round, concave, no eyes with a mouth full of teeth directly in the middle. Picture a rose three-quarters of the way through blooming but much uglier. It lowered its head to the ground in a type of pounce and let out that growl again. It sat up off its haunches and started its walk towards the house. As it did, the other crawlers made their way out in front in a sort of protective move. Pops looked out and looked over at June and me. Open fire. The three of us started shooting as Pop made his way around to, what I assumed, was the other side of the house. Grandma popped up between the two of us, and for the next fifteen seconds, we were dropping crawlers like flies. Then we realized how they were able to take all the lives in a city full of people who were wildly unprepared. More crawled their way out of the muck and came to center around this thing, about two hundred of them. My stomach dropped into my ass and I told Grandma and June that I loved them. These things weren't but only one hundred yards out when Pop laid the barrel of something big over the windowsill. Everyone, get behind me. I moved behind him in just enough time to recognize a belt-fed M60 before the thunder began to sound like firecrackers. Pops rained down hellfire and brimstone for the next twenty-two seconds, and when I peered back out of the window, there were bodies just lining the muck. As I looked over the carnage, I realized that the rain had stopped coming down and had slowed to the lightest of drizzles. They can't survive without moisture! We won! We won! As I turned to tell everyone the rain had stopped, a crash came from the ceiling, and the large crawler came crashing down on top of Pops. He grabbed it by the bottom of the head and tried to push it up and away from his face. As he did this, it meant I was looking directly into this thing's maw. It let out another one of those growls that terrified me to the core, and I froze. 
I watched as the smoothness of the inside of the thing's head drew back in on either side of its mouth. Two, two-foot circles filled with smaller ones as it basically sucked in the skin around the area, a tripophobe's worst nightmare. It growled and the inner circles began to shake. I watched as Pops lost his handholds and the thing rammed the corner of its head into his torso. Pops let out a gasp for air and just started throwing punches wherever they would connect. I guess Grandma finally shook off that growl because next thing I know I see the top corner of this thing's head being blown off and it double over into the corner. It quickly scrambled back to its feet and out of the broken window. I watched it, my scream, into the night air and start its dig back into the muck. I looked over at Grandma and June, and they stared back, breathing heavily. That was... insane. Pop sat up from his position and stared over at me. He took a deep breath in through his nose and sat up in a panic. June, Brian, are you two okay? We are fine, Pops. What's wrong? Red, talk to me, Red. It's just a tooth-grazed deer. I protected you and planted two good shots in one of their esophagus. It was worth it. Pop stood up and ran over to Grandma. Pack your stuff, boys. We're moving. As this story ended, we find ourselves at the crossroads of darkness and mystery. Our journey has only just begun. If you dare to delve deeper into the realms of the unknown, if you thirst for more bone-chilling tales and heart-pounding thrills, then join our community of fearless explorers. Subscribe, like, and comment below, and together we shall uncover the secrets that lurk in the shadows. Are you ready to embrace the darkness?